So thank you for the, for the invitation. It was really, really a great talk uh, this, uh, this morning. Um, Jonathan did a wonderful review of cell signaling, cell death uh, signaling, and, and therapy, Didier talk about the, 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 the synapse and Fabris about some um, clinical application. So what I would like to do is to talk about physiopathology, but I want to, to, to present you a, a new result. And I want to, to, to show you a new diagnostic tool we are, uh, we are develop in the lab. So uh, we have um, a wonderful review of the, of the physiology. I will say a few words on that because uh, it, was, it was fantastic this morning. So I will talk only about the periphery of hearing. So here is the external ear, the tympanic membrane, the ossicol the inner ear with the cochlea and the vestibular organ and Jonathan described that uh, very well. So this is a scanning electron microscopy image of the cochlea. And one point important to understand the, how the cochlea is coding the sound is that each sound is coded in the a specific area in the cochlea. So the high frequency sound are coded at the base of the cochlea and low frequency sound are coded at the base of the cochlea. So now if we talk about the, the air cell, uh, we already know that there is two types of hair cell which are very different in terms of morphology and in terms also of functioning. So the outer hair cell here is a three row of outer hair cell we saw this morning too. This outer hair cell has um, multi properties and they amplify the vibration inside the cochlea to increase the vibration and the sensitivity of the organ. So when you lose the outer cell, you lose hearing. And they also um, exhibit the frequency selectivity because they amplify the vibration in the very narrow area of the cochlea. So they do two things. They um, improve the sensibility of the organ and they improve the frequency selectivity. And so this amplified vibration is transmit to the inner cell and the inner cell uh, transduce this mechanical signal to electrical signal by release uh, the neurotransmitter, which is glutamate. And when the glutamate is released, there is a regeneration of action potential in the auditory nerve. And the auditory nerve will convey the signal from the, the nerve to the auditory cortex. So what I want to talk today is the coding in the auditory nerve. So Didier described very nicely the, the, the very specific synapse of the inner cell, which is called ribbon synapse. It's called ribbon synapse because um, there is a ribbon. 
surrounding by vesicule and this vesicule are filled with a fields with a neurotransmitter which is glutamate and i will come back with um, this type of neurotransmitter later and when glutamate is released it will act at the level of the postsynapse on the glutamate receptor which are mainly um, AMPA receptor. As Didier told you this morning, there is about, the inner cell is connected by about 20, 10 to 20 uh, fibers. And so when the inner, when the serocilia are depleted, there is an entry of potassium into the cell and the cell depolarize and you will have an activation of calcium uh, channel and when calcium is released there is a fusion of the vesicule and release of the neurotransmitter and the neurotransmitter will activate AMPA receptor at the postsynaptic level, which in turn will generate action potential. So that what I can say is um, the, 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 the physiology, I would say, of the, of the cochlea, at least some notion I, I need to, to go further. So now let's see the coding into the auditory nerve. So the gold standard to study the physiology of the auditory nerve and also the physiology of the cochlea is a recording of single unit directly into the nerve. So what we use is a very thin glass pipette and we introduce this glass pipette into the nerve and we record only one fiber. So here I want to, I want to show you what happened when I uh, apply a sound. Here is a pure tone sound. Uh, here you will see the generation of action potential. Here you will see a raster plot means each trial. So I will show you 60 trial. And here is a peristimulus time histogram. So it's a summation of the action potential. So let's see what happened when I stimulate the fiber. I don't know if you hear the sound or not. Do you hear the sound? No, maybe not. No, no, we don't hear you. We don't so, hear the sound. No, we don't. Okay, no problem. But you see the action potential firing in response to the sound. So here in red, this is a first spike, uh, the first spike. And what you will see is for each trial, the, 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 the first spike is very well synchronized. So there is very, very, very few jitter, okay? Now, if I do the summation of, uh, of the action potential here, you will see, and Didier described that this morning, you will see that there is a huge, increase in the firing rate at the beginning of the simulation and then there is a fast adaptation and uh, a plateau which will code the duration of the simulation okay so the Paris stimulus histogram is first an onset peak fast onset peak and then fast adaptation to a steady state uh, activity. So here 
the, the, the problem with the fiber, and also Didier talked about that this morning, is they are not all the same. And as Didier told you this morning, there is a high spawned uh, fiber. So this is fiber with a discharge rate above 18 spike per second. And this spike rate has a very, very low threshold, it means they react to the very low sound stimulation. And this is what I show you here. So this is a firing rate as a function of sound. At zero dB, zero decibel, there is at least no sound and you can see the spontaneous rate. You must realize that in the cochlea, the firing rate is, can be very high. Here, this fiber uh, discharge uh, um, with at 100 spike per second, which is a lot. So in that sense of sound. So then when you stimulate the fiber, you have an increase of the discharge rate. And then this fiber saturate, finished. There is fiber, intermediate fiber with lower um, discharge rate. And what is interesting to see is the threshold here is higher. And then if you stimulate, you have an increase of the discharge rate and then a saturation. More interesting, you have very low spontaneous rate fiber with one spike or maybe less per second. And in this case, the threshold is much higher and the, the dynamic of the fiber is wider. So what I, what I want to say is um, usually the, the dynamic of the fiber, the coding of the intensity is, below, is between 0 and 20 dB. Uh, the, here the activation is 20 to 40. Here is much higher, something like the dynamic of the fiber is 40 dB. So you have to, 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 to keep this in mind that to code the sound stimulation. So the cochlea has to code from zero to 100 decibel. And to do that, they will progressively recruit the high spawn fiber loss threshold. If you increase the sound, you will recruit the medium fiber. And if you increase the sound, you will recruit the low spawn fiber high threshold. And with this characteristic of the fiber, you can code all the dynamic of the cochlea. In addition to different spontaneous rate, different threshold, they have also uh, different um, temporal uh, properties. If you look the high and the medium spontaneous rate fiber, the low spawned, you can see that at the beginning of the stimulation, you have a huge onset peak and followed by a fast adaptation. But if you compare with the low spontaneous rate, look, the, 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 there is, the peak is almost, is very, very small, and also the adaptation is very poor. So in addition to the spontaneous rate, the threshold, you have also difference in adaptation and also difference in the peak to plateau ratio. So why we have this diversity. So I talk about the, the, the coding of the, of the intensity. Uh, 
we work on gerbil and gerbil is very, very interesting because the, I would say the audiogram in terms of frequency looks uh, like the human. Okay, this is the same range of frequency. And here I show you the, the distribution of the fiber as a function of the frequency. And if you look quickly like that, you can see that there is many red fiber, low, high spawned fiber in the low frequency range and many green fiber in the high frequency range. So to prove that, uh, we count the fiber from uh, half an octave and uh, for one octave. And here is the distribution. And you can see that in the low frequency range, so below six kilohertz, you have almost 80% of high spontaneous fiber, which code for the low threshold. And if you look in the higher frequency range, you have a more, I would say, balance uh, of the different pool of fiber with one third of high, one third of medium, and one third of low. This is very interesting because if you think about Bevior, this animal has predator, snake, uh, wall, and when they see a predator, uh, you, you will not hear the sound, but you, you will see the, what they do. They, the animals stamp on the floor with the, with the, with the food to, to make a noise, a low frequency noise to alert the congener. So when I go to the animal care and I arrive and the, the, the gerbil stamp on the floor and make noise to say, hey, you're right, he will, he will keep you. So, and this is logical. This animal have um, many high spawn fiber to detect this signal. So they have, to detect the signal even at low intensity. Now, these animals talk a lot. They use vocalization to, 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 to exchange, and to exchange, and especially in noise, they need the three type of fiber because we know that the low spawned are very important to, for the speech intelligibility in noisy environment. So the, the composition of the nerve is very important in terms of ecological function. The problem is we don't know the characteristic of the fiber in human. We don't know. We don't know the proportion of low and high uh, fiber. We don't know the, 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 the temporal properties. We, don't, we do nothing. We do nothing, but we put cochlear implant to simulate uh, the fiber. We, 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 we put uh, hearing aid, uh, but but we don't know the characteristic of the fiber. So now how we do in human for clinical evaluation, what kind of tool we have. And Fabrice this morning talk you, talk, show you some, some results in clinic. In fact, there is two main tools. The first is the compound action potential, 
So the compound action potential is obtained from an electrode uh, placed uh, on the wrong window or on the promontory through the tympanic membrane so with an anesthetic or an electrode put in the external canal. And when you do that, what you record is the compound action potential of the auditory nerve. You can see here the N1 uh, deflection and the P1 deflection. And with this test, you test the only the auditory nerve. And you have the auditory brainstem response. So here, what you do is you, you will measure the wave one, which is exactly the same uh, component, auditory nerve component, but record from an uh, electrode on the, at the surface of the skull. And you have five waves, and the, the fifth wave is a colliculus, inferior colliculus. So with this tool, you can explore the brainstem from the nerve to the colliculus. The problem with this test, and this is my, uh, the, the, my main message today, the problem of this test is that the wave one of the ABR, which reflects the nerve, or the N1 wave of the electrocochlear cathetery will reflect the, 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 the activity of the nerve just result from the summation of the first spike firing in synchrony in the fiber. So by using this test, what you see only is the first spike firing in synchrony at the beginning of the stimulation. And you have no idea what happened after. You have no idea of the, 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 the fast adaptation. And you, 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 you have no idea of the spontaneous rate of the fiber. So you have an information, but very, very poor information. In addition, we did an experiment where we measure the compound action potential from the wrong window, like clinician, and the first spike latency of the fiber at the same time. So if you look the compound action potential, you can see that it result from the summation of the first spike uh, firing at the beginning of the simulation. So here is when we record at the same time uh, medium fiber, but when we record a low spontaneous rate, high threshold fiber, you can see that the first spike latency is delayed. And so because the first spike latency is delayed, the N1, uh, the, the compound action potential do not catch, do not capture the low spontaneous rate fire. So that's a problem too. So you cannot see the, 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 the you see only the beginning of the stimulation. You have no um, adaptation information. You have no adaptation on the on the spontaneous rate, and you cannot catch the, the, spontane the low spontaneous rate fight. So how can we go further and how can we have some new information? At least for the spontaneous rate activity, a simple idea, simple idea, is to put an electrode on the wrong window without any sound and to record the neural noise. So you do nothing, you put an electrode and 
you are supposed to record the mean spontaneous activity of the of the nerve and this so what we do to 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 for facility and to to treat the information we do a fourier transform and as you can see what we have is a um, is a peak around 1000 okay so this peak correspond to the wave to the shape of the action potential huh, around one millisecond. So when you have this kind of signal, you have the spontaneous activity, but you can also record the evoke activity without any synchronization. And when you do that, you see that the one uh, thousand peak increase with sound interesting now if we put ttx on the wrong window to block the auditory nerve activity you see that you have no more spontaneous activity no more evoked activity and you can self say for sure that what you measure is really the, the activity of the auditory nerve. Uh, now what we did, we subtract the spontaneous activity from the evoke activity to have uh, a neural index, more easier to, 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 to manipulate. And we want to, to probe, to, 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 to test if this um, neural index is more uh, precise, more efficient to track the, the, the low spawn fiber, for example. So to do that, what we did is we perfuse into the cochlea uh, wabai. Uh, we previously show that when we put 33 micromoles of wabain into the cochlea, we destroyed all the spontaneous, all the low spontaneous rate fiber. So you see here, there is a lot green fiber. When we put wabain, they all disappear. And if we count the, the, the synapse, you can see that this low spot, which are at the base of the cochlea, completely disappear. So this is interesting because we have a cochlea without any low spontaneous rate fiber. So now when we use a compound action potential, the so classical clinical compound action potential, you can see that there is here is the amplitude of the potential as a function of the of the sound. There is no change at all, and you and we lose at least twenty percent of the fiber. Now, if we record uh, our neural index, so neural noise, you can see that we get a huge reduction and. This huge reduction is more pronounced at higher level where the low spawns are activated. And what is interesting is the, 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 the spontaneous rate of the neural noise uh, is mostly uh, produced by the high spot fiber and in fact when we destroy the low spot the spontaneous rate uh, neural noise remain so here we have an interesting tool next uh, you with this kind of tool you can go further you can go to 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 use more ecological sound like for example amplitude amplitude modulus modulation sound you can if you can use this kind of sound you can also use in animal 
vocalization. There is no problem to use vocalization. Is a vocalization of Charbel in white. And you see that we get an ugly signal. You can work uh, with this tool uh, in noisy environment. So here is a um, vocalization in noise, and you can see that we can also work on this type of uh, signal. And of course, of course, we can work with uh, speech, uh, yeah, no problem with that. The problem with this tool is you have, you have an idea of the spontaneous rate, but you have no idea of the temporal characteristic of the signal. And to get this kind of information, we set up another test. So this test consists to present um, noise On n'entend plus. Oh, sorry, you, you, you lose me? Yes. Uh, uh, when you lose me? Uh, like uh, 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Here? After. Uh, after. Afterwards. Oh, okay. So okay, from now. You, you, you didn't. <laughs> it's not a problem. So, what I say is then we set up a new test to get the, the temporal characteristic of the signal. And to do that, what we use in is uh, band noise. Band noise, why? Because there is um, fluctuation. So what we get when we use uh, uh, band noise is, uh, uh, as you see here, is a fast, uh, response, um, a neurophonic response followed by envelope fluctuation, uh, which is dependent of the adaptation of the fiber. Then we rectify this signal and we have a rage. And when we do that on the wrong window, this is very important. When we do that, what we obtain is a response which mimic the PSTH of the fiber with an onset peak, fast adaptation, and a plateau. And we call this response record from the wrong window PSTR for peristimulus time response. And so, the, the hypothesis, what we assume is that this response is a summation of the individual peristimulus time histogram from the file. And so if it's true, what we should see is if we have a high proportion of ice pond, low threshold, what we will get is a very uh, high peak to plateau value. And if we have a lot of low pond, this peak to plateau ratio should be lower, reduced. Now, when we record this response in Jarbol, and I remind you that in the uh, low frequency range, there is 80% of high spont and a more balanced uh, distribution at the base. You can see that when we measure the peak to plateau of this response at the wrong window, the, the peak to plateau is much higher in the low frequency range 
than in the high frequency range, which is, uh, which supports the hypothesis that this response is a, is a summation of individual uh, single unit fiber PSTH. But to go further, to prove that, what we did is uh, we did the um, simultaneous recording. So we record the PSTR at the wrong window and the PSTH directly from the, from the nerve in 43 uh, fiber. And when we did that, we could compare directly the two measurements. And what we, what we show is when we compare the fast, the rapid uh, adaptation time constant between here, you can see that we are a very, very nice correlation between the PSTR as a run window and the PSTH of the fiber. Now, if we compare the peak to plateau ratio, we have also a nice correlation. And what is very interesting, that is a little bit indirect, but what is very interesting is that we have a nice correlation between, between uh, the peak to plateau ratio and the spontaneous rate of the fiber. So let me just explain. So if we have a peak to plateau of, for example, 6.5, with this uh, result, you can predict that the mean spontaneous rate of the fiber is around 35 spike per second, okay? Now, if you have something like three peak to, to plateau ratio, you will have a mean spontaneous rate of 10 per second. Then we want to validate this model to another species. So here we are in gerbil. We want to, to know if we can use this, uh, this model uh, in mice, for example. And so we, did, we had a collaboration with um, Charlie Lieberman. Uh, in fact, what we did, we measure the PSTR, the wrong window in mice, and uh, we compare this result with a single unit of, uh, of Charlie. And when we compare the thing first, the, 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 the fast adaptation time constant here, we do um, an average of the, of the to R time constant through the fiber. You can see that this mean nicely fit with a PSTR based prediction is in red. And in addition, when we look the spontaneous rate of the fiber, the PSTR, the uh, peak to plateau ratio PSTR predict nicely the, 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 the spontaneous rate, uh, the mean spontaneous rate in mice. And just uh, one point is, you remember in gerbil, there is a difference between base and apex in the distribution of the fiber, which is not true in mice. And our model fit very well with that. Now, Let's see what we can do with that with a synaptopathic model. So some years ago, many years ago, I would say, uh, we showed that uh, acoustic trauma induced an acute excitotoxicity. 
So in fact, when you have a trauma, you have an excess of release of glutamate and glutamate is toxic for the auditory nerve fiber. And as you can see here, the, 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 the excess of release destroyed the auditory nerve fiber after trauma. We get the same with ischemia, for example, but with ischemia, the problem is the uptake mechanism of glutamate uh, are not uh, op operating during ischemia. And so you have also an increase of the, of the, glut of the glutamate concentration. What is interesting, and Saeed, Saeed remember that, he worked on that with us also, is uh, after noise, for example, so you lose the, the, the connection between the air cell and the fiber, but some day after, you have um, a repair of the synapse. Here you see that there is a fiber which regrow and you have, a, and five days after, one week after, we have a normal uh, synapse, but depending the, the intensity of the trauma, the duration, the duration of the trauma, we can or we cannot, uh, we, we lose fiber or we didn't lose, okay? So with this uh, acute synapto uh, excitotoxicity, we can have a very nice model of synaptopathy. So we replicate this uh, recently. Uh, we perfuse glutamate into the, 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 the cochlea. You see that uh, kinate, sorry. After kinate, we have a decrease of the, of the synapse, we lose the synapse, there is some uh, recovery. Uh, if we measure the compound action potential, we have a decrease of the, we have an increase of threshold and a recovery of threshold. And some, uh, with some uh, remaining um, uh, decrease of the amplitude at high stimulation. But what is interesting is when we record single unit in this animal after a cytotoxicity, you can see that here is a distribution of the fiber. You can see that we lose a low spont and we have only high spont which remain. But what is very interesting is we have remaining high spawn fiber, but the, the spontaneous rate is higher, much higher, twice higher than in normal. So means you lose low spawn, but also you have an increase of the remaining uh, spontaneous rate fiber, which is very interesting in terms of tinnitus. For example, this could uh, explain tinnitus because you lose lo lo the low spawn, but the remaining high spawn uh, discharge like crazy. Uh, let's go. Now we, we, we had a, a collaboration with Sharon Kujawa to, to test our PSTR tool in, in trauma. So uh, in gerbil, when you do trauma, uh, you have an increase of threshold, about 60 dB increase in threshold, the, 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 the day just after, and then a full recovery of the, of the threshold. And if you measure the compound action potential, you have a decrease and you have a recovery. And look, the recovery is almost complete, almost complete, even high, high uh, stimulation. So when we count the synapse, you can see that we have, uh, we lose synapse in the 16K, uh, area, 
and we lose about 30%. So we, with 30% synapse loss, you see almost nothing on the compound action potential. Now, when we use our tool, the PSTR of the wrong window, what we see, and this is very clear, is in the traumatized area, we get a decrease of the plateau. And here is a quantification. You see that we get a nice decrease of the, of the plateau. And this decrease is correlate to the synaptic loss. If you look, the peak, which reflects the synchronization of the first spike latency, we get almost nothing as with the compound action potential. And now if you measure the peak to plateau ratio, you have an increase of the peak to plateau ratio, of course, the peak don't change, the plateau decrease, which means that we have a higher proportion of the higher proportion of the ice pond uh, rate fiber. So which fit with the kinate uh, hypothesis. Um, this is very interesting because it, there is some data showing that after noise, uh, this is the data of Rutinger in uh, 2 million, who show that when he, when he do a sound trauma, he has uh, one third of the animal uh, who, ha, who suffer, well, you don't know suffer, but who, who express uh, tinnitus. And when he compared the animal with the same exposure, with tinnitus and without tinnitus, he can show that animal with tinnitus present a decrease of the synapse. Now, what will be interesting is, is this decrease of synapse is followed by a change in the phenotype, for example, uh, an increase of the spontaneous rate. So, and it will be, this will be my conclusion. Can we measure the spontaneous activity, the adaptation, etc., in human? And so to, to do a proof of, of concept in animal, uh, we take advantage of the cerebellopontin angle surgery. So this is a collaboration with uh, Xavier Dubernard at the uh, Reims Hospital. And in this surgery, what they do, they monitor the activity of the nerve by putting an electrode on the nerve to, to preserve the nerve. And we get the chance to access to eight normal or subnormal hearing patients. And so we take advantage of this electrode to measure our PSDR in human. So we get a nice response, which is uh, an interesting result. And using this metric, we can predict the, um, the fast adaptation time constant in the auditory nerve in human. And also we can predict, at least in the area where we stimulate, we can predict the, the spontaneous, the mean spontaneous rate also in human. In, in this case, it was 23 spikes per second. So to conclude, um, we can in the future use a trans tympanic or ear canal uh, electrode uh, to, to, to track the spontaneous rate in human, of the auditory nerve in human, adaptation. We can track uh, the loss bone fiber. Uh, so a nice tool to, 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 to track neuropathy, nice tool to track 
tinnitus, a nice tool perhaps uh, to try the hyperacusis. And also what, what would be also interesting is to, uh, to have this kind of information before to put a cochlear implant, because when you put a cochlear implant, you have no idea of the, the functional state of the nerve. And so it would be nice to fit the cochlear implant as a function of the residual uh, auditory nerve fiber, the, 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 the functional properties, the threshold, the adaptation, etc. And also we could do the same, why not, for from hearing aid. And I think this kind of test would uh, for sure increase the comfort of the of the patient. So thank you very much. And I'm open for any questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor uh, Puel. I'm sure we will have uh, many questions uh, for you. And thanks again for this very clear presentation uh, and all the work you, you are doing in, uh, in Montpellier and all the collaboration you, are, you showed today. Uh, yes, I see someone who raised his hand. Ah. Let me check who it Aziz. is. Uh, Aziz. Hi, Aziz. Pleasure Hi, to see you. you. <laughs> thanks for the nice presentation. As you may imagine, I am interested in one of the tools you presented, you and your own developed, which is the PSTR. And my question is, I am happy to see that uh, you can, it can apply in mice. My question is, what can we do beyond uh, normal hearing mice and trauma noise trauma mice? I may mean how, for instance, potential defects upstream the neural intervention for mechanotransaction may impact such recordings. Can we use these recordings to compare wild type and uh, deaf mutants? But the uh, simple question is, when do you recommend this tool uh, to use beyond CAPS or EBRs, or when do you think it's really necessary to use? Uh, yes, uh, Aziz, yes, your question is, is very pertinent. So here, the data I show you is only data after no trauma, but normal hearing threshold. Because we are not uh, yet, <laughs> we have not enough information what happened when the, when the outer cell are destroyed, how this uh, metric will react. So for now, we just compare at, uh, at normal threshold. So in the first attempt, I would say this tool would be very interesting to, 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 to be used for uh, hidden hearing loss and to track neuropathy where the threshold are not so much uh, damage. But I don't know, maybe we can use this, uh, this tool in other pathology, but we have to explore that. The second, um, my second point is, uh, now Jérôme uh, Bourrien is, uh, is building a computational model of human cochlea. And so we are uh, testing, <laughs> we are testing RPSTR in silico. And uh, so we, we play with a scenario of low spawn, high spawn, destruction. We play with a change in the phenotype. We put only high spawn, only low spawn. And the next step, of course, will be a deletion of outer cell and so on. But for now, my answer is uh, only uh, hidden hearing loss, to track hidden hearing loss, hidden hearing loss. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have a second question for, for you, Professor Puel, uh, from uh, Didier Dulon. Yes, Jean-Luc, thank you very much for your talk. Very interesting. 
Congratulations for this very interesting data. I'm sure they're going to be a very nice tool for the future. For the future. Uh, I, I only have two uh, basic questions regarding uh, the effect of uh, Wabain and Kainite. Uh, I'm ju I just uh, wondering why, uh, why you are affecting only the low spawn fibers with uh, Wabain and uh, why uh, we are losing low spawn with, with Kainat also. Ah, that's. Uh, <laughs> Do you have an idea of that? Do you have some hypothesis on that, or it, that's a very good idea? So, to be to be frank, I would say I don't know, but I will try to 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 give you uh, some 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 answer. Uh, what is amazing is whatever you do. Trauma, kainate, mm -hmm. wabain, the most age, age, the most um, fragile fiber are the low spawns. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe there is a, a several mechanism to explain at the function of the trauma, at the function of uh, wabain, but what is true is so. The low spawn are thinner. Mm -hmm. uh, they have few myelin. So maybe when you put a drug, uh, they, they are less uh, protect. They have, and this is very important, much less mitochondria, much mm -hmm. less mitochondria. Uh, for example, to, 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 to for calcium um, buffer, for example. So uh, I, I think they are more fragile, but, mm -hmm. but maybe uh, uh, glutamate and, uh, and AKTPA is, uh, is a different mechanism, but mm -hmm. This needs to be uh, to be defined. Yeah. Oh yes, this is to be yeah. to, 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 to be investigate further. Yeah. Jean-Luc, another last question is: It's about your, your models are in the gerbil, correct? Yes. Main data in the gerbil. Have you seen also in the gerbil, uh, like it has been shown by Lieberman and others in mice, whether uh, large ribbons are associated to low spawn fibers? Are you confirming that in the, in the gerbil or not? Uh, this is what we are doing now. We are doing some. I, I, I cannot really answer answer for sure. I presume this is a, this is a universal, universal. say loy. Uh, yeah. um, but um, for sure, I, I, don't know I don't have know no quantified that yet. Okay. But it looks like it's the same, really. Okay, okay. okay. thank you, Jean-Luc. Thank you to you, Didier. It was uh, interesting to, 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 to talk after you talk. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a third question uh, from Patrick Verando. Thank you, uh, Professor Puel, for you. Very nice talk for a non-specialist I am, so it was very clear. And my Thank question you. is about uh, my own case, because I have a tinnitus, and I would ah. like uh, to know what is new for the knowledge and the treatment of, because it's already 20 years I have this, <laughs> and uh, I don't see anything new really, even not very understanding. No, you're right. Nothing is really new, unfortunately. Uh, so the problem, but I want to comment on that. Mm -hmm. The problem of tinnitus is, how can I say, very complicated because I, my, my, my feeling and my hypothesis is there is not only one mechanism. I show you one mechanism where you lose low spawn 
you keep high spawned and I spawned react like crazy and probably this can uh, destabilize uh, the, 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 the cochlear nucleus and create um, a tinnitus uh, and a perception of, of sound. But this is one particular, I would say, um, mechanism. For example, trauma and trauma when you get enough loss of synapse. But tinnitus, there is many, many, many kind of tinnitus. This is what we call uh, uh, neurosensorial uh, uh, tinnitus, auditory neurosensorial tinnitus, which are tinnitus which affect purely the auditory system, but there is somatosensorial tinnitus, which are linked to other uh, sensory system. There is some uh, mechanical tinnitus relate to the, to the muscle, you know, to the, uh, there is vascular tinnitus with a pulsatile tinnitus, so that you, you can treat if you have a, a vascular loop. There is, um, how can I say, tinnitus due to, 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 to pressure in the brain, to, 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 to tumor in the brain, to so, neural degeneration. <laughs> so that the problem is, if somebody tell you I have the, the miracle molecule, don't trust. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Thank to you. Be. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Verando. Thank you, Professor Paul. We, we have also a question uh, from uh, Carol Baron. Yes, uh, yes thank Carol. you. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, you were showing uh, that we have different pools, pools of fibers. Okay. I wanted to know uh, how do they behave du during aging? Is there a differential, um, I mean, behavior uh, for each? kind of fibers. Okay, uh, so Didier talked about that this morning, but uh, he talked, to, so here again, it depends the model. The Didier uh, talked mm. about the black cis module where you have a, a loss of outer cell and a loss of synapse. Uh, we work on uh, Sprague de Lille, uh, rat, for example, and in the rat, uh, amazing. So there is few decrease in hearing, so few uh, hearing loss due to age. Uh, we look the hair cell, we look the synapse. They do not lose synapse. But when you record single unit, what you see is they change the phenotypes. That's why I was very, very interested by the, the talk of Didier and the, <laughs> the, the, the spontaneous rate decrease. So it means you don't lose synapse, but they change the phenotype. That's why I asked Didier if uh, uh, changing the phenotype could be uh, uh, an early sign of, uh, of degeneration. So that, that's the, my first point. The second point is uh, Sharon Kujawa, for example, showing mice that uh, at the, in the middle age of the mice, which correspond to 50 years old in humans, for example, you lose air cell and you have a, a, a progressive deafness. But what she show is you have oui. a progressive loss of synapse all along the life lifespan. And what she saw, what she demonstrated is you can, you can lose 30% of the synapse 
without any threshold shift. And what she, what she show is, is probably the lowest point, which are the most fragile, which disappear first. And so when you lose a lost point, you have no deafness, but you have problem to understand speech in noise. This is well also document too. So before to have problem of really of deafness, you start to have a difficulty to, 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 to understand in noise because you lose uh, low spawn. That's why it's very important to, to have a test really to, 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 to diagnostic this, um, this loss of synapse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alice, uh, you had also a question and, and then we will have a last question with Jonathan Gale uh, before to, to continue. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Uh, just a very naive question. Uh, how do you determine that you have a tinnitus in animals? Ah, so there is a, there is behavioral test. So in Montpellier, what we did, we, we set up a test where uh, this is a conditioning test. So for example, we train rat to, to do a task usually a stupid task, a jump on the pool, for example, when you put a sound who looks like a tinnitus. And we know the tinnitus because we record single unit, we know the frequency, etc. And then, then you, you, you create a tinnitus, for example, with high doses of salicylate, with trauma, and the animal will jump on the pool like, uh, like a crazy. So this is a way to, 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 to measure tinnitus in animal, or you can do some conditioning, you know, go to the dark side, uh, no, go to the light because they like the, the dark and stuff like that. And the last test, which is more discussed, is to use a gap detection. So you put, you measure the start, starter response. Mm -hmm. You put um, a noise just before and you put a gap, a silence. So when, when the animal is normal, it detects the gap. Because it detects the gap, it, the starter response is reduced. And the idea is he, if he has tinnitus, the gap is filled by tinnitus, and so he don't take, he don't detect the gap, and he will uh, uh, start again. Okay. So, but this is discussed because this is a reflex, mm. and tinnitus is a perception. So we don't know exactly if it's really a good test, but interesting. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And Jonathan, if you want to ask the, the last question of the session. Hi, Jean-Luc. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really intrigued by how easy this um, uh, technique is to do for clinicians, uh, given that it could be a, a really nice way to monitor the um, recovery of synapses in, in any trials. Uh, the question is, can we use this test to, to monitoring the recovery of the synapse? Yeah, and how easy it is for clinicians to actually do it, to actually implement it. Ah, so for, for now, for now, to be really honest, the only recording we did in human is directly from the nerve in the operation bubus. So we are now in the process to do this, this recording from an electrode into the auditory canal. I don't want to go <laughs> too, too far away, but it, it looks he work. <laughs> so and probably uh, it will be it will be easy if he work. He will put uh, some. Um, uh, on dit, uh, un bouchon, 
You will put something in the ear, an electrode, plug. Plug. a plug. Voilà, a plug uh, with uh, with electrode on the ear canal, and it will be simple. No problem with that. Should be simple, but we'll see. 